And so I just want to say good evening to everyone. And I hope you all have enjoyed our tour through the book of Joshua, talking about some principles of victory. I love that word victory. It, it's just such a beautiful word. It's a Bible word. And it's our word, victory. And as the old song says, victory in Jesus. And I'm excited to be with you all and share with you this evening. Um, next Wednesday, Lord willing, uh, we have a special testimony from a member of New Life Ministry. And this individual is going to be sitting in this chair or one similar to it. And they're going to be sharing their testimony. And we hope we can incorporate that. Um, if sometime you feel that on your heart and because there are people that's wearing your shoes or have wore your shoes and and they need to hear what God has done in your life personally, it's always powerful. So we're excited about that next Wednesday. So I'd like to give you a moment. If you have your Bible with you, you can find uh, Joshua chapter 5. And in Joshua chapter 5, um, we have the children of Israel, now they're past Jordan, so Jordan's behind them. They cross that river, but Jericho is in front of them. Jericho is so vitally important for Israel to conquer the rest of the land. It's like that key stronghold place. Um, it's spiritually speaking, and I won't get into Jericho, but Jericho is that big thing in your life that when you conquer, it opens the door for other things. But we'll talk about that a um, couple of weeks. What I want to talk to you about this evening, let me just remind you all that in Joshua, we're talking about how to uh, live. And if I, I want to use a word, a word out of Joshua, chapter 1, verse 15. And I love this word, and this sort of, this word puts the essence of what we're talking about because God says, I want you to go in to, to my inheritance to you, my gift to you, a land flowing with milk and honey. And even though it had giants and big walls like Jericho, God says, this land is my gift to you. And then he says, I want you to go in and enjoy the land. Now, remember for us, it, it's not a land, it's a life. It's a life now. Uh, heaven's going to be heaven. I mean, no sin, no burden, no pain, no death, no nothing. But this is the thing that, that Christians just really need to get, is God didn't just come to save our soul and take us to heaven. He come to save our life. John 10.10, 10, the thief, the devil, is, comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Jesus said, I've come to give you life and that more abundant. And so the essence of what we're teaching is enjoying the life that God has given us. And man, when you look around today, you look at very few Christians who really enjoy their salvation. You know, and so I love that word. And, you know, you see a lot of people, you know, we go into work and we put our time in for a paycheck, but very few people enjoy it, right? And it's sad. This is the way a lot of people have become, even in their own personal life. And there's no enjoyment. There's no fulfillment in their marriage, in their home, in their, in their job or anything else. And my dear friend, I want to tell you something. Be, listen, it's be like, a, a, take a millionaire. Okay, this guy's just inherited a million dollars. But he's going to live in a, in a mobile home and in the middle of nowhere and just live off bread and water. You're going to be saying, dude, you just got a million dollars? And you're going to live like this? And it's not that he's content. And so this is like so many Christians. God has given us so much. And you have to say, why are we living like paupers? Why are we living like we're barely making it through? So that's what we're going to talk about. And I'm going to give you uh, this evening three solid biblical principles 
How to get on and conquer Jericho, the big thing in your life. And you know what? I want to tell you, I don't know what is going on in your life. I don't know what mountain you're facing. I don't know, I don't know your difficulty. Uh, but I just want to tell you, these principles are going to work 24-7 as long as you live. They're very powerful. And so I asked Whitney uh, tonight, I needed three symbols to um, put some light on my three principles, okay, to obtaining and enjoying the victorious Christian life. The first one is a knife. The second one is the Bible. The third one is the best I could do, a pair of shoes, okay? So, and you're going to say, what in the world are those? And I, listen, they throw a lot of light on our teaching tonight, okay? So, here we go. Stay with me. Here is the first principle that I want to give you. And I'm taking these from Joshua 5. Because now, now listen. So, they crossed that big, ugly river of death. They made that step of faith. It's behind them. Wipe the sweat miraculously God opens the water in front of them so there's a celebration but now fear might start to set in because Jericho now God does something unusual here he says you're not going forward until you deal with something that you're not aware of but it's something that happened in the past. And so God says you can't conquer the future till you deal with the past. Did you get that? What I, the principle that I want to give you, I want to summarize it, is you have to believe with all of your being that your future is greater than your past. Okay? Even though you have great memories, great things that have happened in your life, uh, you, you have to believe God has something great for you. Philippians 3.13 is one of my favorite Bible verses. The Apostle Paul, who was a murderer, a blasphemer, uh, 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 hated Christians, hated Christ, God saved him. The devil could have kept him in that guilt and bondage of his wicked life. But he said something in Philippians 3.13 that I love. He said, Paul said, I'm a runner running a race. And I'm not going to run the race headed that way, looking this way. He said, I am forgetting those things which are behind me. And I'm reaching forth to those things that are before me. Oh, my friends, let's adopt that biblical principle tonight is I have to believe that, that God is keeping me alive and that there are great things ahead of me. How do I get them? How do I get my hands on them? That's the big question tonight. Well, and I'm going to show you how. Okay? Now, in chapter 5, uh, I'm just going to read verse 7 and 8, okay, for time's sake. God is speaking, and he's talking about their moms and dads who died in the wilderness. They come out of Egypt, but they were backsliders. They had no faith. It was fear all the time. They died in the wilderness. They never enjoyed their inheritance in the land flow of milk and honey. And not only because of their backslidden state and their unconcern, and they neglected spiritual things. And God said, you're gonna, you're gonna take care of this situation before you can have victory. So he said, their children whom he raised up in their stead, them Joshua circumcised. They were uncircumcised because they had not circumcised them by the way. And it came to pass when they had done circumcising all the people, they stayed in their places in the camp till everyone had healed up. Now, here's the model. Circumcision was obviously for the male. The male represented his household. 
a male father that uh, obeyed and was circumcised, that was his sign, a covenant sign, that he was committed to the true and living God. The spiritual significance of circumcision is cutting off the old nature, the old man, the old life, living for God in the spirit, in the new life. And so this generation, and, and, and circumcision was an important sign to the Jews in those days, very important, sort of like baptism for a Christian, okay? Um, baptism doesn't save you. But man, it, it is that true sign that I'm committed to God. It is the sign that you're saying when the preacher puts you underwater, you're saying the old me is being buried, here's a new me, and I'm going to walk and live for Jesus. And so circumcision was very sacred. Now, the parents that come out of Egypt, that died in the wilderness, that just gave up on life, they didn't care. They got bitter. They got mean, they fuss, they complain, they cry all the time, and God let them die in the wilderness. And you know what? Because of their spiritual attitude, they neglected their children. <clears throat> and so they didn't circumcise their young men and say, my child is dedicated to the Lord. And so God says, you're not going forward till you deal with the past. In verse number, um, verse number 2, God says, at that time the Lord said, make sharp knives and circumcise the next generation. Now listen to me. Dealing with the past, first of all, let's just take the obvious. Okay, We know it took a while to heal. This was painful. I mean, they had flint rocks, folks, not knives. That flint rock. This is painful. Dealing with the past can be extremely painful. I mean, to cut off, to cut off your past, to cut off that relationship that went sour, to cut off that those words that were spoken to you that just ripped you out inside, to cut off that that thing that you love so much. Whatever it be. But it's the one thing that you can't let go. You, you still have feelings about it. Uh, it, it. It just holds you back. It hinders you. And you can't go on until you conquer this thing. And I'm going to tell you something. Dealing with, dealing with those things that, that we love, dealing with those memories, dealing with those things, we just have to cut it off. And, and, I mean, God says, Bobby, deal with this before you can make the next step to victory. And, you know, I want to tell you something, friend. To run that race with patience, you have to lay aside those things that hinder you and hold you back. I'm going to tell you something. You, this may not be a problem for you, but, oh, my goodness, I know, and I've met so many people. I've met churches. Churches that either split or have had problems to never, ever, ever become the church that they were. Because they can't let go of the feelings. They can't let go of the past. And they keep holding on to those things. And I'm going to tell you something. For you. Forget about those things that are behind you and start focusing and moving forward to the things that, that are ahead of you. And all you have to do is you have to just say, your Heavenly Father, just say, God, Help me to forget about the past and to move on to the future. And God will help you. And when I'm talking about forgetting, I'm not talking about erasing it from your memory. But I'm talking about stop letting that thing. Don't even talk about it. Don't even bring it up to anybody anymore. Okay? Act like you got some spiritual amnesia. And I don't even remember that thing. Okay? Because, because just the fact that you talk about it and it comes up again is a sign that it's still there in your spirit. And I only encourage you, my dear friend, to just let it go. Amen. And there are, there are churches and ministries who just can't let it go.
put the old conflicts. The old, have you failed in the past? Confess it to the Lord. Get up on your feet and move to the future. Have you laid those sins in, in, in the past in your life at the feet of Jesus? Leave them alone. Forget about them. Yeah, people, people will let you go. People will keep bringing that stuff up. But you know what? Me and you is not. Okay? That's behind me. Oh, my goodness. I want to tell you all something. I, one of the most embarrassing things for me, looking back over my life, totally embarrassing, is I went through things, and I'm being honest with you, I went through some things in the past that were gut-wrenching. And I just knew the sky was falling. Do you know what? I can't even remember half of them now. At the time, because the devil's good about magnifying things, at the time I thought, it's over, I'm done. And here I am. And God's still opening doors, and God's still using me. And so, friend, I want to tell you something. You just let it go and move on. That's, that's God's word, okay? Let me say something else on this, okay, um, about the past. In chapter 5, I want you to look with me in verse 11 and 12. Because the reason I'm bringing this up is because not only is it in the text, but when we're dealing with the past, I think this is a subtle one. Okay, this is a subtle one that we need to be aware of because it may not be a failure. It may not be a sin. It may not be a bad thing in the past that's kept you from reaching the future. It may be a good thing. Let me, let me, listen to me. Let's read this. God says, okay, now, they did eat of the old corn of the land on the next day after the Passover. Verse 12. Listen carefully. God says the manna ceased. The manna stopped on the next day after they ate the old corn of the land. Neither had the children of Israel manna any more, but they ate of the fruit of Canaan. Oh my goodness. I love this. This stuff excites me and fascinates me. And here's, here's the spiritual point the Holy Spirit is saying. is, And, and I've done this though. Is it may not be something in the past that's bad that's keeping us from the future. It may be a good thing. It may be like you had a great experience with God in the past and you're still living off that experience. And God is saying, I'm fresh. I'm not a stale God. I want to do new things in your life. I want to do greater things in your life. That's why we got to keep believing and keep praying and keep seeking those things that are before us. Wow, I wish I could just convince Christians and, and churches and just people that God Almighty has great things for us if we would just seek Him. You know what? God says the old manna is over. You're going to eat the fruit of, the, of Canaan. Friend, you listen to me right now. It is scary of how much of the fullness of the Spirit that Christians are missing because we're not willing to keep in step with the Spirit. I'm going to tell you all something. And I will tell you real quick. And it's just, it made me mad. I'll just be honest with you. I was preaching a revival up toward the Cub Run area. It was a Friday night and this uh, Southern Gospel group was there singing. And so the Southern Gospel group, they got up and they sung, and uh, a lady out of the Southern Gospel group sat down behind me. And so after they sung, there was four teenagers on a Friday night at a revival. Okay? And these four teenagers wanted to sing a song. So they got up before I preached, and they started to sing a praise and worship song. And the lady in the Southern Gospel group behind me tapped me on the shoulder. I'm not making this up. And she said, I really don't care for this modern stuff. That made me so mad. You know why? 
Because she was living off the old corn, the old manna, when the Spirit was moving in this direction, raising up the next generation to sing praise and worship to the glory of God. And praise and worship is nothing new. It was way before Southern Gospel in the book of Psalms. And so she, this woman is... I'm just trying to be nice and I'm trying to smile. But it's these kind of Christians in our churches who say, well, I like how it used to be. And they're dying. They're dying. I grew up on the Heavenly Highway hymns and I love them. And I, I got revived and rededicated and fired up. But I love Southern Gospel. Love it, man. Two went in hands. The cathedrals and, and Gold City. I love that. But man, I love praise and worship. And praise and worship is so beautiful because nobody can really show off their voice. And it's to the Lord. What am, what's God saying, brothers and sisters? He's saying for... It's sad. Some of us Christians, are, are, we're not in step with the Spirit. Free, if you think... I'm not talking about leaving the faith. I'm not talking about leaving the truths of the Word of God. I'm not talking about that. But I am talking about leave your old tra man-made traditions. And if the Spirit wants to do something new, He'll do something new. If Jesus wants to take a blind man and just say, see, and the guy's eyes are open, He did that. He took another blind man, put some spit on the, the dirt, made some mud, swabbed it on his eyes, and said, go wash in Jordan. Fred, don't put God in a box. And this is the reason some of us can't go on to greater things in our life is we're living on some past experience, something that happened years ago. Oh, my goodness. That's a, that's a word we need. Keep in step with the Spirit. They that are led by the Spirit are the children of God. Let's get over here and enjoy the fruit of the Spirit instead of living off the old Corn. Are you with me on that, you all? Oh, my goodness. I had to stress that. That's such a great point. Here's the second point. Okay? Remember the first one. You have to believe your future is greater than your past. Second of all, the Bible are symbol. This is so important. Obedience to God is greater than sacrifice to God. Okay, let me, let me take it out of the text. And God is talking about the old generation, these people that saw the miracle of Red Sea opening up, coming out of Egypt. Listen to what God says about them. Let me find it here in verse number 6. And there's a phrase I want you to mark in verse 6. God was not pleased with this generation. The children of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness. Till all the people that were men of war which came out of Egypt were consumed. And, and mark this phrase, underline it in your Bible. Because they obeyed not the voice of the Lord. God doesn't care how much money I put in the plate. God doesn't care how eloquent or fine titled my sermons are. And we... We could go on and on and on. God loves obedience. Do you remember that fellow in the Old Testament named Saul? And God said, now listen, you tell me if this is not plain. God said, I'm going to send you over here, and I want you to, these are, these are bad, wicked people, and I want, you to, I want you to, we're going to war. And God said, slaughter everything. Okay? Slaughter everything everything. I don't want to hear the voice of nothing alive. That was it. So Saul goes over there, King Saul, and he goes to battle, and he comes back, and Samuel says, hey, did you obey the Lord? And Saul said, yeah, man, we went over there, we whipped those guys, and we did what God said. And Samuel said, why? I'm hearing sheep. Did God tell you to slaughter everything? Yeah, why am I hearing sheep? And Saul said, very religiously, oh, yeah, man, we killed everything but the sheep. Oh, we wanted to offer them up to the Lord and sacrifices and thank Him. And Samuel said, 
That's not what God wants. 1 Samuel 15, 22. God wants obedience, not sacrifice. He wants a sacrifice, but He wants obedience. You know? what? Okay, so, so I go out here and I gamble. Now, I know some of you may get offended by this, but hey, whatever. Here's an illustration. So I go out here and I gamble. Okay? And I, and I, I spend my money to gamble. And, I, and so I, I, win, I win a little money. You know, I spent $500 over three months period uh, for lottery tickets. And then I won $50. And I, I, you'd think I just won it all. And so I'm going to put some in the plate and give it to God. <laughs> That's exactly what Saul did. And I want to tell you, friend, can I, I want you all to listen to something. I'd like to share something with you. Somebody needs this. This... This principle of obedience was the first principle God taught me, and I'd like to just share just a second with you a little personal testimony. Acts, the book of Acts, chapter 5, verse 29, they said, you guys, stop preaching and using the name Jesus. Boy, America's getting close to that. Stop preaching using the name Jesus. Peter said in Acts 5, 29, we ought to obey God rather than man. If you're a parent or a pastor or even a Christian, you listen to me right now. I was working for How Tools back in the 80s. Mr. How Tools never opened the store on Sunday. And I had just gotten my life straightened out with the Lord. Okay, I wasted my teenage life and I just rededicated me and I mean I was just I was just so excited and fired up and I knew I needed church. You know, I needed church. So I started going to church again and at Core Hill. So my boss comes to me and I love him to death, Wayne Harper. Love him. And so Houchin sold out and they started opening on Sundays and I was going to have to work. And I, and I, just, I was just so young, man. I'd just come out of a backslidden state and I was green and I needed help and church was really helping me. I said, I hated to work. I hated to miss church. It was just killing me. So I didn't know what to do. So here's what I did. I started fasting and praying. You know, I might skip lunch. Because I wanted God to know, Lord, what do I need to do? What do I need to do? I, I need church, but I have to work. I, I, I'm not condemning people. Nurses have to work on Sundays. I'm not condemning. I'm just telling you this is my, where I was at. And so anyhow, to make a long story short, for three months, I fasted and prayed. One day I was reading my Bible, and every time I opened my Bible, I'd, I'd read it and say, God, is God going to give me an answer today? One day I was reading my Bible, just reading it casually, in Acts 5.29, it said we ought to obey God rather than man. Oh my goodness, that verse jumped out of the book, slapped me in the face, and I knew immediately God said, Bobby, you're to obey me rather than those men. Quit. Quit your job. And you know me, I was like, I had to just pinch myself. I'm going crazy. I'm a religious fanatic. But I knew God had spoken. I knew he had spoken to me. I quit reading and I just bowed my head. So I go to my boss, Wayne, and I say, Wayne, I'm going to quit. I'm giving my two weeks. I just, I can't work on Sunday. I'm, I'm growing. I'm fighting the devil. I'm, I'm looking. I, I, I need help. I just, I got to be in church. Just got to. And I love Wayne to death. He's a spiritual mentor to me, and it, it just tore him up. One Saturday, my last day, I was standing in aisle one at a miracle whip display. This is how clear it is to me. Because I he had already went to my supervisor. My supervisor said, No, Bobby, you can't have off. You gotta work. I knew this is what God said, do. This is my paycheck. I was scared to death, but I knew God had spoken. It's a faith fear thing. It's like the guy who said, I believe, help thou my unbelief. My supervisor walks in, Bernard Lawrence, and I love Bernard, love him to death. 
He walked in. I'll never forget. He come in that door and he walked over there to me, this little green Christian. And he looks at me and says, Bobby, you don't have to work on Sundays anymore. Oh, wow. I ran to the back room and I was so fit to be tied. I was on the mountaintop. Is I was facing this humongous dark step with you know no paycheck, nowhere to go. But I trusted God. I obeyed God rather than men. And when I obeyed God, look what He did. And not only did I keep my job, I mean I got promoted, I got raises, and listen to what I'm saying to you. Listen to this. Obey God. And leave all the consequences to Him. Did you hear me? You know, I'm talking to somebody out there and you look like all of hell's coming against you and you feel like the sky's falling and whether it's a relationship or a job or whatever, it doesn't matter. And you say, Brother Bob, I don't know what to do. I'll tell you what to do. You get your Bible and you just read the New Testament. And you just try with all your heart to do what God wants you to do and leave the rest to Him. It's not our responsibility to fix all this. Our responsibility is just to do what our Father says. You know, you're a parent out there. You listen to me, you're a parent. You're not obligated to your kids. You're obligated to God. You say, oh, Brother Bobby, I brought my kids up right and they're living in sin and, and they're doing wrong, but I've, I've got to love them and I've got to let them in my house and I, I know what they're doing is wrong. Hey, you're obligated to God, not man, even if that's your child. Let me tell you why this is important. If you become obligated to your child while they're living in sin, do you actually think you're going to help them? But if you stay dedicated to God and you let your child know, I love you with all of my heart, but I love God more and I'm obligated to Him, then God will take care of the consequences. It takes faith. If you're a pastor, man, us pastors, there's too many men pleasers out here. There's too many pastors afraid to, uh, as, as Vance Havner said, you know, we're afraid to rock the boat, so we let the devil sink it. You know, I had a guy to pull up at Houchins, my first church, and, and, and toot his horn in his pickup, and I got in, and he got red in his face, and he stuck his finger in my face, and he told me what I was preaching he didn't like. And the Holy Spirit said, you ought to obey God rather than man. And I looked at this dude and I said, I should obey God rather than man. And so I'm going to keep on preaching the truth. Now I want to tell you, if you're out there and you're a teenager, you obey God and leave your life in His hands. Don't obey these, these, these friends, so-called friends that want to lead you into sin and lead you away from Christ. It takes guts, it takes courage, it takes faith. In the United States of America, some people better get some of this courageous obedience. That's why God said in Joshua chapter 1, time and time and time again, have courage to do what's right, courage to obey, courage to obey. And once more, once you obey the Lord, leave it with Him. You as a parent do what's right, leave your kids with God. Obey God, preach His truth, leave your church in His hand. It goes to every aspect in life right now. You say, Bobby, I'm in this relationship thing and I want to live for the Lord. My spouse does it. Well, you live for the Lord and leave your spouse in God's hands. It's His responsibility. Man, God is good, friend. Nobody's going to stand behind you like God. Nobody's going to take care of you like God. And if we try with our best to do what he says, I'm going to tell you something. Oh, my goodness. He'll tear those walls down in front of us. He'll defeat those giants in front of us. He will open those rivers in front of us. With God, nothing's impossible. And if God be for us, who can be against us? Mm, isn't that a good word? And I must hurt. Here's the third principle. Okay? You have to believe your future is greater than your past. You have to believe just obedience is better than sacrifice. And the Bible is the symbol for that. Okay? 
Now, here's the last one. This is beautiful as we close out. I'd like to read these verses in chapter 5, verses um, 13 through 15. <clears throat> so here's Joshua. Man, he's got a lot on his back. Oh my goodness, he's so burdened down. He's got all these people, men, women, boys and girls, children, grandchildren. And he is facing the biggest stronghold on earth, Jericho. Walls so high, so thick, you could build houses on them. Then there's a wall inside a wall. Houses built on top of the walls. Watchtowers on top of those. And you're like, my goodness, man, what? he don't have a chance. And he gets up early, stays up late, and he's out just thinking. And as he's out thinking, meditating on, Lord, I don't know how we're going to do this, somebody shows up. Let's read these. It came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked, behold, there was a man, a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. And I love this about Joshua. There's no fear in this soldier. Joshua goes to him and says, Are you for us or are you for our adversaries? There was no middle with this dude. No neutrality. This man says to Joshua, Nay, I'm the captain of the host of the Lord. Am I now come? This is a pre-Bethlehem appearance of Jesus. The writer of Hebrews calls him the captain of our salvation. How do you know, Bobby, it's not an angel, but a pre-Bethlehem appearance of Jesus? Because Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped him. Every time a true angel was felt worshipped, they would say, no, 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 Mary, get up. Daniel, get up. You don't worship me. Joshua said, What saith my Lord to his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said to Joshua, This is why I got the shoes. Loose your shoe from off your foot. The place where you stand is holy. These shoes walk the world. And the world gets on the bottom of these shoes. And God said, Joshua, in my presence, I want you to put the world aside. I want you to forget about Jericho. I want you to forget about spiritual warfare. I want you to forget about this sinful world. I want you to forget about, even though you said I'm, uh, that, that you're my servant, the Lord says, I want you to forget about working for me. I want you to forget about Warfare, work, the world. I want you to forget all, about all of it and just worship me. And friend, you've got to get this. Here's the third principle. Your future is greater than your past. Obedience is greater than sacrifice. And worship in God's eyes is greater than work. Worshiping the Lord is greater than working for the Lord. This is proven good by two precious ladies, Mary and Martha. Jesus visits their house like he visited Joshua. Martha, she's your busy, busy, busy. She goes to the kitchen, and man, she's got pots and pans and the oven going, and she's cooking for Jesus. Hey, cooking for Jesus. It's a great thing. Jesus sitting in the living room, and Mary's in there sitting at his feet. And he's teaching her. So Martha comes running in there, all tense and all stirred and all in the flesh, even though she's cooking for Jesus. And she comes in there, stomps her feet and says, Jesus, would you tell my sister Mary to get in this kitchen and help me cook something for you? And Jesus says, Martha, sit down a minute. He says, Martha, your sister has chosen the best part. You see, friends, Jesus 
is not only worthy to be worshipped, he deserves to be worshipped. And you know what's wrong with a lot of us? We're too busy. We're too busy for Jesus. There are churches that think the busier they are and the more stuff they got going on, the more spiritual they are. And then if you turn your phone off, your TV off, and you go into your room and you shut the door and you turn your fan on or your noise maker and you just sit at the feet of Jesus, the devil will say, man, you're wasting time. You should be cooking in the kitchen, mowing your yard, da-da-da-da-da. Worshippers. Matter of fact, in John 4, Jesus said, my father's looking for worshipers. You know, you can find workers a dime a dozen. In church, find them everywhere. It's hard to find worshipers. You know the difference in a worker for the Lord and a worshiper? A worshiper will take you deep with God. And before I close, let me tell you why this principle is important. God said, Joshua, we're not going to conquer the future to deal with the past. He says, Joshua, you're not going to win any battle till you get on your knees. And this is what makes me love Joshua. Abraham Lincoln said we need men of velvet steel. On the battlefield, steel. In the closet, prayer closet, as, as the New Testament says, velvet. And this soldier, Joshua, who was not afraid of nobody on the battlefield, is on his face before the Lord. Let me tell you why this is important. You need to listen. By worship, Joshua is giving recognition to who is in control. And there are so many of us, look at us. We don't take time to spend with God. We're going to go out here and whip the devil. We're going to go out here and we're going to fix things. We're going to go out here and change the world. We're going to do all this stuff and the church is getting nowhere. You know why? Because in worship, we're saying, Lord, I can't do it. I can't. I can't defeat these giants. I can't bring down these walls. I'm a nobody. But Lord, on my knees, I'm saying you are God and you're bigger than anything I face and I worship you. Oh, you know what I wish you would do tonight? Or whenever you catch this word, I wish you would just shut everything off and get alone. Pour your heart out to God and just say, God, I know I, it's time for me to move on. And I want to do what you say, Lord. You just show me the next step that I need to take. And I'll do it no matter what it costs me. I'll take that step and leave the consequences with you. And just worship Him. Okay, would you do that? Just worship Him. Matter of fact, if you get on your knees, don't even ask Him for anything yet. Just get on your knees and close your eyes and get in His presence. Get in His presence. Go to the throne in your spirit and just sit at God's feet. And worship Him. Tell Him how good He is. Tell Him how great He is. Tell Him how much you love Him. Oh, friends, what a mighty God we serve. I love being with you all. I love going through the book of Joshua. And so let's just keep praying for one another. If you tune into this, hey, well, if you don't have a church family, we'd love for you to come. New Life Ministry, we're located, uh, I think it's 46, 36 Park City, Glasgow Road, 1030. Uh, check our Facebook page out, but um, we love you guys so much in the Lord, and go and have a victorious week. Amen.